Good evening, everyone. Thank you. My name is Marianne Peters, and I'm the new Chief Executive Officer of the oh, Carter Center. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. President. <laughs> It's my very great pleasure to welcome you to the first event in the 2014-2015 uh, Conversations at the Carter Center series. The series gives us an opportunity to discuss Carter Center programs in peace and health and current world issues with our neighbors in Atlanta and online. On our website, you can watch past conversations and learn more about the upcoming conversations as well, so I commend that to you. We want to extend a special welcome this evening to the Rosalind Carter Mental Health Journalism Fellows, the Fellowship Board, and the task force members who are here tonight, as well as our Ambassador Circle and Legacy Circle guests, members of the Carter Center Board of Trustees and the Board of Counselors. And since this conversation is being uh, seen via webcast as well, a warm welcome to our virtual participants. For the next hour and a half, we will all have the pleasure of hearing from former U.S. President Jimmy Carter and former First Lady Rosalind Carter on their activities here at the Carter Center. And they also will answer your questions and some that we've received from online participants. If you have not already done so and you have a good question, I urge you to um, take advantage of the note cards that will be distributed uh, so you still have a chance to submit a question if you would like to do that. Now it's my honor to introduce President and Mrs. Carter. <laughs> President and Mrs. Carter founded the Carter Center 32 years ago. Since then, the center's programs have helped to improve life for millions and millions of people in more than 80 countries. The center's staff in Atlanta and around the world work daily to realize the center's motto, waging peace, fighting disease, building hope. And they do this both by engaging at the highest levels of government and by working side by side with poor or neglected people at the grassroots, people who deserve help to shape their own destinies. I've only been on board two weeks, and a busy two weeks it's been, and yet I already know that President and Mrs. Carter are the center's hardest working volunteers. They travel tirelessly around the country and around the globe, working with our experts to monitor elections, resolve conflicts, promote human rights, uh, and eradicate or control diseases in developing nations. I traveled with President and Mrs. Carter to China earlier this month, and I can assure you that their energy and dedication were truly inspiring and even intimidating. <laughs> it is President and Mrs. Carter's vision of a world at peace where people do not suffer needlessly that guides our work here at the Carter Center and serves as an inspiration for millions of people seeking a better life in countries around the world. So please join me in welcoming to the stage President and Mrs. Carter. I think Marianne did a fine job, don't you? <laughs> in fact, she came to work the 1st of September, and she made two major speeches while we were in China. And so she had to uh, come right up to snuff, and she, I think she's done a lot of uh, research work on the Carter Center even beforehand. As you may know, she's been the provost of a Naval War College, so she and I share a lot of interest in the Navy, and she's a former ambassador and knows the world quite well. She's a good administrator. I understand a very tough administrator, so the Carter Center has a lot to look forward to with her leadership. 
And we want to express our special thanks to John Hardman, Dr. Hardman, who's been here for 25 or more years doing the same thing, and he was with us also on the China trip. Well, my job tonight is to teach, tell you a little bit about what the Carter Center has been doing lately, and I'll run through the programs quite rapidly and bring you up to date, and then uh, Rosa will give her presentation, obviously, and then and we'll answer your questions. So I'll start by just pointing out that we have now completed 96 troubled elections. The Carter Center was the organization that started international observation of elections, and uh, now we've done it in uh, almost 40 countries. The last one we completed was Madagascar, and we will uh, do uh, Tunisia uh, for the second or third time uh, in, uh, in October, the 11th, and then again uh, in, in November. So those are the two that we're now working on, and we're also dealing with others that will come a little bit later on uh, in the future, and that's the Democratic Republic of uh, Congo especially. Two that we thought we would be doing this time that we have uh, withdrawn from doing, one is Libya because they have so much violence that all of the international observers have withdrawn from Libya, and uh, there's no foreigners now going there because of the conflict that's taking place all over the country. And the other one is Egypt. Many of you know the history of Egypt. The Carter Center has been there from the very beginning. Uh, Anwar Sadat was my good friend. Mubarak was his vice president uh, when I negotiated a peace agreement between Israel and Egypt. And we've uh, monitored their previous elections quite thoroughly and with perfect uh, success as far as observers were concerned. But the latest developments in Egypt have convinced us that there are not any basic democratic elements that are necessary for an honest and fair election. So there's no reason for us to waste our time uh, in Egypt uh, participating in an election that won't comply with any kind of international standards. Uh, we also have within uh, the Democratic Republic of Congo, in, a, in addition to preparing for elections in, 19, in 2015 and 2016, we're training particularly domestic observers to take over there, and we'll be there for those elections as well, which we've done the last two elections in, in the Congo. We're also working on a, uh, a program in, the, uh, Dominica, in, in, uh, the, the, uh, in Congo to monitor their selling of mining uh, jewels, you might say. They have precious uh, raw materials that they sell. They've been selling them at, at a bargain to foreign buyers. If a foreign buyer could come in from Madagascar or from other, some other place uh, and bribe the, the uh, cabinet members in charge of a particular area, they could get the uh, minerals at a very abbreviated price. And so the Carter Center has been working on that for a number of years, and we've now gotten uh, the Democratic Republic of Congo to agree to, to raise their standards of selling and buying up to international standards. They, they make now the contracts that are con conducted between them and buyers available to the public. So that's another thing on which we'll continue to work. As far as human rights is concerned, I would say that our major, cons major interest in the last three years has been the rights of women and girls. And this is a, the most terrible deprivation of human rights, I think, that goes on in the entire world today and is basically unaddressed. I wrote a book called A Call to Action recently, Women, Religion, Violence, and Power. And it shows in some detail, maybe you'll all, some of you have already read a copy, I can get a copy of the book. It shows in detail the horrible atrocities that are committed against women not just overseas, but also within our own country here. And at the end of the, of the book, I put down 23 things that we can do to help correct this problem. And since the book came out, there's been a lot of attention given to abuse of women on the campuses and in the military and in uh, human trafficking, which is really slavery. The level of slavery now exceeds whatever it was in the 18th and 19th centuries when we were getting black slaves from Africa and bringing them over to the New World. And in Atlanta, Georgia, every month, between two and 300 people are brought in in our airport and sold into slavery. And the State Department, required by law now for the Congress to report on slavery, says there are 60,000 people at this moment living in the United States of America as slaves. This is hard to believe, but it's true. And the reason that Atlanta is so popular in bringing in human slaves, 80% of whom are girls sold into sexual slavery, is because we have the largest and busiest airport on earth, and at the same time, a lot of the passengers that come into Atlanta come from the southern hemisphere where girls' skin is brown or black. 
and a brothel owner, a whorehouse owner, can buy one of those girls for about average of about $1,000. And these girls come in thinking they're going to be made into beauticians or nurses' aides and things like that, and they find that they are sold into a brothel against their wishes. This goes on in the United States of America. Another two things that we worship almost in America are the great university system and our military. And there, the sexual uh, assault against women is two of the most serious places because the president of a college or university or the deans don't want it to be known that on their campus, girls are still molested. And the, the uh, Department of uh, Justice reports that one out of five, at least one out of five girls who enrolled in a university in America are raped or sexually assaulted during their four years in college. 41% of all the colleges and universities in America have not reported a single instance of sexual assault on their campuses in the last five years, which shows that they're covering up this horrible abuse that takes place. And this is, it goes on, same thing in the military. Uh, it was reported that in 2012, the Defense Department made this report, that 24,000 cases of sexual assault in the military, only 3,000 of those were ever brought charges against the rapist, and that's about 1%. And, and this is prevented because commanders-in-chief of a ship or of a marine battalion or an army uh, uh, group uh, have the right to, to block the investigation of the rapist, and they don't want it to be investigated because they don't want a, re a reference on their own record of sexual assaults against women uh, who work under them. This, this goes on and it's now being uh, in increasingly addressed. On a global basis, I'll just give you one statistic, two that, that are horrible. This is hard to believe. At this moment, there are 160 million girls missing from the face of the earth because at birth they were strangled by their parents or because with new sonograms, they can be detected as females before they're born and they are aborted because the parents want boy boys. And this is particularly onerous in India and in China where they've had a policy for no, many years of one is best, two is most. So they limit the number of children in a family to mo mostly just one and the family wants a boy. So they just kill the girl before it's born or at birth. There's a, there's a movie that came out in November called It's a Girl that covers this particular instance, and they have a, an Indian woman on that who quite proudly says that she has personally strangled eight of her newborn daughters because her husband and she could not afford to feed too many people in their family, and they wanted boys. And, and this, this goes on, and another, the last thing I'll mention to this is a whole bunch of these, is that in, in, in many parts of Africa, the, the sexual organs of girls are mutilated at birth or before they're four years old. And although it's against the law in many countries like Egypt, in Egypt, 90% of all the living females have had their sexual organs mutilated. And they're done by a, a woman called a cutter, and she goes in with a razor blade or some sharp instrument, and she removes the outer part of a woman's sexual organs, and sometimes they sew up the orifice so it's very tiny so the woman can only urinate. And this is supposed to deprive them of sexual pleasure. And in some countries, 97 or 98 percent of the women are treated this way. Little girls are treated this way. And about half the countries in Africa uh, have more than 50 percent of the girls who are done this way. That's what the Carter Center is working on now as our major human rights program. I'll, I'll just cover a couple more things. Uh, in, uh, and and this, this, will, this, this will deal with, uh, with our health program, which is, as you know, about 65 or 70 percent of our total budget. Uh, we're working on... Uh, Liberia, Rosa was going to cover this, I won't cover this, that, but uh, Ebola is a, is a major outbreak. The Carter Center is being fairly cautious about Ebola because we've communicated quite thoroughly with the Centers for Disease Control and the World Health Organization, and they advise us that unless somebody's highly skilled in this, that we shouldn't inject them into the area. But we are volunteering our people who are, have been working on our law program in Liberia, and that's about 7,000 cases that have been brought dealing with judges and so forth in little villages all over, all over Liberia. We have volunteered to help uh, them communicate and, 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 and address the problem in individual villages throughout, throughout that country. 
Uh, in Syria, Syria is another very serious problem on earth in which the Carter Center is deeply involved. Uh, we, our people go into Syria quite regularly uh, to Damascus and other places. We go, go into to Lebanon and drive about 125 miles to Damascus through a, sometimes a war zone to get to the, the fact that we can now compare and prepare both sides. I know there are more than two sides of, of the conflict in, in Libya for the time when some resolution will come, and we're trying to get, spell out the principles on which a future agreement can be reached to bring peace when it is possible in Syria. The other thing that we do is to map the conflict that's going on in Syria because nobody else was doing this. We worked first with Google, who helped us with some of the techniques, and we have other contracts as well. And so now we present our map of where all of the different fighting forces are located in Syria, and we bring it up to date almost every week, and we give that information to the World uh, Health Organization, and we give it to the United Nations, and we give it to the U.S. government and others, so that if they want to find some avenue to take uh, supplies to, uh, to individual groups, they can use our map to find a way to get there. I won't go into any further detail on that to save time. On Israel and Palestine, as you know, the Carter Center is probably the only organization in the world that has full-time offices in Jerusalem in Ramallah in the West Bank and also in Gaza City. So we still are working behind the scenes, but we're well keeping the U.S. government and others acquainted with what we do to prepare for the time when the peace process might get a new vigor and can come into hope, hope again. In uh, Venezuela and other countries in Latin America, Panama, and so forth, uh, we have uh, monitored their elections with a high-level group, a small group, and we're still trying to promote harmony between countries that, that on the verge of outbreak of civil war by helping resolve the problem, problems between the news media and the government. China is a long story. I won't go into that because we just got back and I'm full of it. But uh, <laughs> I think if, if there's one decision I made when I was president that it will have the most profound effect on the entire world on a long-term basis, it would be normalization of diplomatic relations with China. And I, I say that even though I brought peace between Israel and Egypt, and, and, and as you might say if you're not particularly friendly toward me, I gave away the Panama Canal. So <laughs> those, those were kind of earth-shaking things at the time and have had a long-range beneficial effect. But I think China is much more important because at the same time that uh, Deng Xiaoping and I announced that we were going to normalize relations between our two countries after 30 years of, of war and animosity, uh, Deng Xiaoping also announced openness and reform, and that has brought about a, a total change of the life of everyone in China, and that's about 1.3 billion people, and it's all of them are, are better than they have been in the past. And now China has expanded its influence, its diplomatic influence, to almost every country on earth, where formerly they were fairly well isolated, deliberately. And, of course, they have now the second largest economy on earth. And in the next few years, I don't, don't know how, quite how long, China is going to exceed the United States in total economic growth and income. So that's what's going on in China. We have some differences between us that Deng Xiaoping and I recognized quite well at the time we were normalizing relations. Uh, they were much more serious then than now. And the Carter Center is working very hard, and we'll continue to do this for a long time in the future to, to try to ease tensions between these two great countries so that we can get along with each other, even though we do have a difference in culture, background, history, and, and form of government. And we'll be competitive in the future in some ways. And now, just to get down finally to the, to the health program specifically, oncopsychiasis, we just, uh, this year, gave our 200 millionth dose of uh, mectazan to prevent river blindness. We've made wonderful progress there. Uh, we had river blindness, as you know, in six countries in, in Latin America, and now we've eliminated the prospect of anybody going blind from onchocerciasis. We still have one little tiny tribe of Yanomami Indians that live on the border between Venezuela and Brazil. And you can't even tell where the border is. I've been on that, that same river fishing, and the people that live there don't care whether they're in Brazil or v Venezuela, but it's hard for us to get to those villages because we have to have access to it. And it's, it's easier to get there from, by taking a helicopter from Brazil and flying into the villages to take care of this disease than it is to go from Venezuela. But we have to get a diplomatic agreement between the presidents of Brazil and, and, and Venezuela to give us permission to do that. And that's what we're still working on. As soon as we do that, we'll have the end of uh, onchocerciasis or aurora blindness in this entire hemisphere. Another facet of, of working in this hemisphere is Hispaniola. 
which it consists, as you know, of two countries, Haiti and Dominican Republic. They're the only uh, countries that still have malaria in, in, this, in the Caribbean, and they also have lymphatic filariasis, which is elephantiasis, a terrible disease that we treat all over the world. And uh, we, we have made a pledge now to eliminate these two diseases from these two countries, one of them perhaps the poorest country in this hemisphere, and that's Haiti. In, in, in Ethiopia and, and Nigeria, we have changed our policy in Africa on onchocerciasis or river blindness. In the past, we've just controlled the disease by giving one tablet a year, which Berkeley Company gives to us, and if you give a person one tablet a year, they won't go blind, uh, and, and it alleviates some of the symptoms. So we've been doing that and just controlling the disease. But with our good success in Latin America, we've now found out that you can do away with the disease completely in the country, and that's called elimination. So our goal now, instead of controlling river blindness, is to eliminate river blindness. And we're working on that in the two most uh, severely afflicted countries, that is Ethiopia and, uh, and uh, Nigeria, and we've already proved it can be done uh, in uh, Uganda and, and in Sudan. So we're working on, on, on that disease as well. The last one I'll mention is trachoma. Trachoma is, uh, is a disease, it's the number one cause of preventable blindness. And the Carter Center now perform, you, have to, you can either operate on the eyelids because the upper eyelid turns inward, and when you blink your eye, the eyelids slash your cornea and causes blindness. Except for, for cataracts, it's the number one cause of blindness on Earth. And the Carter Center has had the leadership role in this in a number of countries. Uh, and and we have, we've now treated 100 million people for this disease with a, with a, with a medicine that we get for, from Pfizer company called Zithromax. And, and the Carter Center now performs about 40% of all the eye surgeries on earth every year. So that's the kind of thing that we're working on with trachoma. The, 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 uh, in, the uh, insect that spreads the disease is, is regular house flies. So one of our major commitments is to get rid of the house flies. So we started out in Ethiopia about five years ago and we thought we might build maybe 5,000 latrines a year, and, and it became kind of a women's liberation movement because the women are prevented from, from relieving themselves in the daytime. So when we built a latrine, they could urinate or defecate in the daytime, so they took it on as a crusade. And the first year, we had 86,500 latrines built, and now we have just passed the 2.9 million mark. <laughs> so so they, they found that one of the founders of the Carter Center is more known as a latrine builder than he did bringing peace between Israel and Egypt. <laughs> so that's a quick rundown of what we're doing so far. But, but I've, I've said many times, if the Carter Center hadn't done anything except what you're now going to hear about, Rosen's mental health program, it would all have been worthwhile. So my wife and the real boss of the Carter Center. And also with um, the latrines, um, just cleanliness is imp so important. And so we teach the people to wash their faces, which they have not thought about before. And also now the, the teachers in the schools check the faces of the, all the children when they come to be sure they wash them. And I think that that is so exciting to me. Well, first I want to tell you how much we enjoyed having um, Mary Ann with us in China. She's a foreign service professional and everywhere we went, and we meet with ambassadors and people from other countries to China, and then we work with the embassy while we were there. And everywhere we went, she knew somebody that she had worked with in, in, um, in some Bangladesh or somewhere. And it was really interesting. Um, she's going to be very helpful to us in that. Well, she told you that the journalism fellowship meeting is this two days, this has been this last two days. And our um, um, fellows are here, they're sitting over here. Um, stand up so everybody can see you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Every, every year. We have these programs, uh, program, um, and we have established them in New Zealand, South Africa, Romania, and now Colombia. And they, they come to the Carter Center. The Carter Center finances the program for normally five years. And then they're on their own. And we work to be sure they can sustain the program um, before we turn them loose. 
And um, so this is Romania's last time, and we're really going to miss them. Um, but um, I think we were with, you were with us for seven years, um, and because we did work with them the last two years to be sure they could sustain the program. Local organizations have been supporting them in this, these countries, um, and we, we're going to be sad to say goodbye to them. They've been very nice, but we have Columbia, too. And Columbia, I think this is the second or the third year third. with the third year with Columbia. So um, really exciting. It's one of the exciting meetings of the year for me because we have people coming in to be trained on mental health issues and how to uh, report them accurately and in depth. And we have been, this is our 18th year of doing this. And We've also, trained. Also well, six are for the United States every year. And then there are two that come from the other countries every year. And uh, as I said, this will be the last year for Romania, but we'll have two from um, Colombia. Actually, we have four from Colombia because they split the fellowship and two people work together on one. Uh, so that makes four. <laughs> <laughs> and they've been really, really good. This is our 18th year. We have had 155 journalists go through our, our program, and I really think it's made a difference in reporting on mental health issues. We have a long way to go, of course, but I'm excited about it. Um, and, but, and another thing is that after the fellowship is over, so many of them continue to report on mental health issues, and, that, and they also influence their um, newsroom at the, um, and get people the, the whole newsroom interested in mental health issues. Um, we, and all, all of our um, journalists are, are very special. We have an advisory board with teams of advisors that work with the journalists. Um, and this year we have one new um, member of the advisory board. And I had to bring some notes so I can, I want to tell you about her. And it's, it's, it's unbelievable what she's done. Her name is Tori Murden McClure. She was the first woman to row a boat across the Atlantic Ocean. It took her two tries the first time she ran into a hur uh, hurricane. Um, and she said that uh, she worked with Muhammad Ali to help him set up his foundation. And she said he, one day he said to her, do you want to be, the bo um, want to be known as a woman who tried to row across the Atlantic Ocean and failed. <laughs> so she went again, <laughs> and she made it the second time. She's one of two and one of six Americans who were the first, one of two women, I think, one in six Americans who were the first Americans to travel over the land to the South Pole, skiing 750 miles from the ice shelf to the pole. She's climbed on several continents, and the first woman to climb Lewis, Nunatuck, I imagine, I guess that's a mountain, <laughs> in Antarctica. She's currently serving as president of Spalding University in Louisville, Kentucky. Tori, could you stand up? <laughs> Somewhere. She's over here. Over Well, the other thing I wanted to talk about is our annual symposium. It's coming up in November. It's always in November. And we bring together the leadership in the mental health field and work on a current issue. This year is our 30th anniversary of the mental health symposium. And so we're going to be looking at what's happened over the past 30 years and then what the future can be. We're calling the, the title Celebrating the Past and Shaping the Future. So I'm looking forward to that with great anticipation. And thank you for coming tonight. We always like to be here to see you for the first of these conversations um, at the Carter Center. Thanks. And I, I might tell you that um, in eradicating diseases, to eradicate diseases, Every disease, of that particular disease, has to be gone in the whole country. Whole world. In the whole world. Um, eliminate uh, a disease is when it's gone from a country or from a place. And we get 
mixed up sometimes on eradicating and, and eliminating. But so I, that had to be made clear to me. So I thought maybe there's some in the audience that didn't know the difference. So we're eradicating the disease guinea worm, which I didn't mention. We're down now to uh, 60 cases of guinea worm. We started out with two and a half million. And we have 60 at the, end of, at the first day of August. This is the last report I have. And, uh, and we hope to get rid of it for the entire world. And, and on, on the river blindness, we are just eliminating it one country at a time. So eliminating is one region or one country, as Rosen said, and eradicating for the entire world. Um, thank you. And now um, President and Mrs. Carter have agreed to take questions. The first question comes from a member of the audience, um, and here it is. To President Carter, you were against anti-Russian sanctions, but they are being implemented. How do you think this situation will develop? Is there a prospect for peace in Ukraine? And what is going to happen in U.S.-Russia relations? So an easy one, sir. I, I should. <laughs> How many of you think I should let an ambassador answer that question? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think the evidence so far is that uh, President Putin is not paying much attention to the sanctions because they've been um, kind of peripheral and not deeply penetrating sanctions like the ones we've imposed on Iran. Uh, Putin has uh, ambitions, as you probably know, to bring back the former glory and influence and power of what was the Soviet Union during the Cold War. And so uh, I don't think he's going to be deterred from trying to make sure that, uh, that we, we don't see the country go back into the European Union uh, orbit. So this is a, a problem that uh, I don't think is going to be resolved easily. The Europeans quite often are reluctant to increase their level of sanctions against the, the uh, Russia government uh, because they get about a third, some of them all the way up to two thirds of their energy supplies, natural gas and oil, from Russia, and they can't afford to do away with those. The United States is kind of impervious to that, so we can call for stronger sanctions than, than the European uh, countries are willing to impose. So my hope for the future is that Ukraine might stay fairly neutral. I don't really advocate Ukraine being taken in as a member of NATO or a member of the European Union. I think that would just be flaunting too much of a flag in, in Putin's face, but I think that Ukraine should be maintained as a, as a free and independent country. And there are areas in eastern Ukraine where the Russians are particularly interested that speak the Russian language. They have the same religion as Russia does, that is Orthodox Christianity. And I think if, if, if they are given a degree of autonomy so they can trade easily with, with Russia and, and cross the border easily and get special favors from Russia. If Russia wants to give, give them, that might be the ultimate solution uh, to the problem. But the government in Kiev is strongly oriented toward uh, Europe, as you know. And so that's a, a, a situation that has to be resolved by the people over there. I don't think that we are going to be able, because of European reluctance, to impose sanctions strong enough to deter Putin from wanting to see the eastern part of, of Ukraine given a special relationship with Russia. He knows he can't get the entire country of Ukraine there. And so that's my assessment of it. I don't have any inside information about it. But I think that in the long term, I hope it, it's resolved peacefully. I hope we give uh, the Ukraine government what they need to, to make sure they can maintain order and, and in, a, in, a, in a normal uh, standards for a country. Uh, and that I don't believe that Russia has any ambitions to try to take the entire country of Ukraine. So Ukraine should stay together. Russia shouldn't take, take over in eastern Ukraine, but let, let U eastern Ukrainian people decide whether they want to have a special relationship with Russia or not. Thank you. Our next question is also from the audience, also for President Carter. Three people are detained in North Korea. Uh, Korea. Recently, during a CNN interview, they asked the U.S. government to send a special envoy to help uh, get them released. In 2010, you visited North Korea on a similar rescue mission. Do you have any advice for the U.S. government on this problem? This is a very sensitive uh, question for me to answer on television. Well, the, in the past, I have been to North Korea three times. And 
every time I've been, I've not only gone on a mission, which I don't have time to describe, but I have also met with the top leaders of Ukraine, I'm actually of North Korea, and they wanted me to bring back a message to the United States, let's have direct talks. But when President Obama came in office, he decided very strongly that he would not have any direct talks with North Korea, which in my opinion is a mistake, but, but he knows more about the situation, obviously being president, than do I. In the past, the North Korean government have asked me to come over to Pyongyang again and bring another American hostage home. But the proviso they put on it was that I had to go as an official representative of the U.S. government. And uh, I informed the State Department about this, but the American government has decided that they do not want to send me over if I am an official representative of the U.S. government. I could go uh, as just a representative of the, of the Carter Center, which I did on my previous trips. But uh, so there's, uh, there's a, a, a policy uh, in the United States government now not to have any official talks with North Korea. I personally believe, again, that we ought to be talking to them. The last time we had talks was under President George W. Bush in the so-called Six Power Talks that took place in Beijing and, and that includes North Korea and South Korea and Japan and the United States and, and China and Russia. So those six nations sat down and negotiated with the North Koreans. What the North Koreans want is direct talks with the United States. And, and they, I think they used these uh, three hostages, two of them are still, I think all three of them are still there, uh, to try to get the United States to talk to them diplomatically. So you see it's kind of a difficult thing for us to do. I can go to North Korea if I want to, uh, and, uh, I, and uh, there's no need for me to go unless I can get uh, a, a, a designation from the U.S. government that I'm speaking officially for the U.S. government, which I cannot do. That, that's the truth of the matter. And it's, and it's, uh, but anyway, I, I've, I've told you the truth. <laughs> Thank you. The next question is for Mrs. Carter. It seems that we only hear about depression and mental illness when a tragedy occurs, like the death of Robin Williams. Otherwise, uh, very little is covered. What more can the Carter Center and others do to increase the dialogue on depression? I have worked on this for 43 years, <laughs> and I don't know what else we can do. When we got our um, fellows program started, um, we were brainstorming then, and that was 18 years ago, about what else we could do to overcome the stigma because the stigma holds back progress. Um, and we have tried everything we could think of, but somebody said at a meeting when we were talking about it, um, why don't we train the press because they have such an influence on how people feel about mental illnesses and those who have mental illnesses. That's the way that program got started. and. I, th I, th I do think it has made a difference, as, as I said earlier, but we still have a long way to go. And if I knew how to get the word out about it more, I would have been doing it up for a long time. I just don't know what else to do. But there's a lot of, of research now on stigma, and a lot of people working on it. And um, hopefully, as, as more and more people realize that those living with mental illnesses can recover and have a good life, um, I do not understand why the stigma hangs on because almost every single family in this country, well, I would say every single family, has either a family member or a friend, close friend, who's living with mental illness. And they know that they're not dangerous and um, um, mental ill people are um, more often um, victims of violence rather than perpetrators of violence. Only 4% of all violent crimes are committed by people with mental illnesses. But the stigma just hangs on and, and holds back. Hopefully, it's, there's so many good things happening in the mental health field now. And um, I hope that, um, I hope that um, we can make some progress, but uh, I've been working on it for a long time. I don't know what else to do. And she'll made. keep on working on it, I guarantee you. <laughs> yes. um, two questions, both submitted online and both on the Middle East, Mr. President. I'll read both. They're similar. 
Has the recent conflict between Israel and Hamas changed your view of how to achieve a lasting Israel-Palestine peace? And the second, the Middle East is in a terrible state right now. Do you see any glimmer of hope for peace and calm in that area? What is the Carter Center doing to help? Well, the recent uh, altercation or war between Israel and Hamas or Gaza has been has been very uh, troubling to me. Uh, as you know, Israel has uh, bombarded, attacked uh, Gaza twice or three times in the last few years. After the first two attacks, I went there uh, just to see what was happening and to meet with my friends, the Palestinians, who have survived the attacks. And every school in Gaza was destroyed. Every hospital was destroyed. And um, I think it wasn't an accident. The American school lay in complete rubble, and I took a photograph of it, an enormous school that had, had almost 2,000 students in it. And the only education being given to the kids was what the United Nations was providing. This time, the reports have been, I haven't been there after this latest bombardment, said that the damage was three times as great as it was in 2008, 2009. <clears throat> so this is, this is a recurring thing. And, and the other side is that the people living in Gaza uh, launch these handmade missiles that are about like a Roman candle, but five inches in diameter. And as you know, at the beginning of this war, only one Israeli citizen had ever been killed by these uh, missiles. Another outside worker was killed, and now a second Israeli has been killed. So it, it's a one-sided thing, but I can understand why Israel wants to defend itself. And I helped negotiate a, a, a ceasefire between Israel and Gaza a number of years ago, which was started in June the 1st and lasted until November when an outbreak occurred again. So I think there's a chance for, for success in the future. What the people in Gaza are demanding is some access to the outside world. As you know, the uh, Israelis tore up their airport and the Israelis have their seaport blocked so they can't get out to the ocean uh, to fish or, or to do anything else. And they can't go to Israel because there's a barrier there. They can't go to Egypt. They have to go to the Sinai Desert, and Egypt has got that box. So the, the one and a half million Palestinians in Gaza live in virtual total imprisonment. They just can't get out or in. So what the Gazans are demanding is that some clear uh, program be worked out to let them have access to the outside world under international supervision. And they're willing for all their shipments coming in or out to be uh, examined by United Nations uh, people or even by some Israelis and some, some other Arab countries uh, over in that region. Well, uh, the only solution to it is what the United States stands for and the rest of the world stands for except for Israel, and that is to go back to the 1967 borders with some modifications of, it, of that area to permit the Israeli settlements that have already been formed to stay there and to swap the same amount of land from Israel to the Palestinians, and for Israel to withdraw from the, from the occupied territories. Those are the two basic things on which the whole world agrees, uh, with the exception of Israel, as I might say. And so this is something that needs to be done. But as you know now, the Israelis have occupied a major part of, the, of uh, East Jerusalem and also the West Bank. And I might add, that Israelis do not want Gaza. Uh, and neither does Egypt want Gaza because it has one and a half million uh, Arabs and the Israelis don't want one and a half million more Arabs to be living in, in the, their one nation in the future if Israel takes over from the Mediterranean Sea to the Jordan River. Uh, so I and, 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 and every country and, and most of the Israeli prime ministers have, have always said the two-state solution is the only one to, to do what I just described to you earlier as, as uh, withdrawal and 67 borders, and let the Palestinians have their own nation uh, on, on the other side of the 67 border line. That, that's the only solution there is. The, the Carter Center continues to try to bring the Palestinian factions together so they can, so they can pledge peace toward Israel uh, and, and have a, an honest election in Palestine. We've already done three elections in Palestine, the Carter Center has, and, and then let that, that group negotiate with Israel. And, and that's what I hope will happen in the future. And, and most, most Israelis want peace, and that's what, that's what I want. If I've had one 
foreign policy issue on which I've concentrated my mind and my prayers for the last 35 years has been to bring peace to Israel. But I know that you can't have peace in Israel without having peace with their immediate neighbors. So peace and justice for Israel and peace and justice for the Palestinians is the only step, and that has to be done with a deep involvement and persistent involvement, and I'd say courageous involvement, of the United States government because no other outside entity has the authority to mediate between the two factions. Thank you, Mr. President. Not too far afield, another question from the audience. Was it a good decision to order attacks on ISIS? Is that for Rosen? Or <laughs> <laughs> well, if she well, wants it. <laughs> I, think, I think we need to attack ISIS. Uh, I'm really concerned about, about them. You know, uh, some people call it ISIL because they substitute s the word Syria, which is an S, for, for Levant, a Levant, which is L. But ISIS, I think, is a, is a major threat to the entire region that surrounds them, the entire Middle East. And uh, I think the United States has made a wise decision to attack them uh, without sending in ground troops by using uh, airplanes and also, uh, also drones, helping the ones that on the ground that are fighting against them. The Kurds are the most effective fighters, and that's in the kind of north and western part of Iraq. The Iraqi army has proven to be cowardly or ineffective in that whenever ISIS came in, they just ran as fast as they could and abandoned their tanks and their weapons to the uh, ISIS forces. The ISIS people are deeply committed uh, theologically and, and, and spiritually to uh, fighting. They don't mind getting killed if they need to. And so that makes them the foremost opponents of the Assad regime in Syria. The so-called moderate uh, opponents in Syria don't want to fight. And when our people go over there to try to talk to all the factions, the only moderate areas we can find that are fighting against, against Obama are, are in Turkey. Against Obama? Uh, against against uh, Assad, uh, are in Turkey. And they uh, are either they're in London or Paris. They don't, they don't go into the battlefield. So I think for us to find moderate opponents to Assad is going to be very difficult. So in Iraq, we will have ground troops to make effective our aerial attacks, which I approve. In Syria, we will not have ground troops except a very weak group that might back up our attacks. And that's where two-thirds of the ISIS troops are located. And they, I think when the war, when we start effectively bombing, they'll move their major equipment across the border into Syria, uh, where there won't be any ground troops to take it over. So to answer the question, is the bombing of uh, ISIS justified, I say yes. And I hope that President Obama has every possible success in getting allies to join with us, some with ground troops that are effective inside Syria. Thank you. Um, Mrs. Carter, what is your fondest memory of serving as First Lady of the United States? This one is a question submitted online. I have a lot of uh, fond memories. But I think one that stands out is when um, we were at Camp David with um, Prime Minister Begin and, and uh, President Sadat. And the last day was a Sunday, and I had been having to go into the White House uh, to do things that were scheduled for me and scheduled for Jimmy. We didn't know we were going to be at Camp David so long. And that afternoon we had um, a concert. Royster Provich? Royster Provich. Royster Provich. Atlanta Symphony. Um, <laughs> Uh, and I had to go in, and Jimmy said, this is the last day. We're either going to, it's either going to be successful or it's not, but this is the last day we're going to be here. So don't come home, just stay there until I call you. And so I got the call in the middle of the concert, and went up. And he said, I think we have it, but don't tell anybody because it's not certain yet. Um, but, um, but alert the staff that it might happen, the staff that had to put together the food and all for reception that we would have. So um, I was standing at the door of the Blue Room, well, right outside on the porch with Mrs. Began when the helicopter with the men came in. And I, I was, st and Jimmy and Prime Minister Began and Stock got out and they came walking up the steps. Um, Prime Minister Began came to Mrs. Began before Jimmy got to me and 
he said, Mama, we're going to go down in history for this. <laughs> it, was, it was so wonderful. <laughs> it was just a, a memory that it was, it was just exciting. <laughs> Very. Our next question comes from a young boy in sixth grade. Um, the first part is for President Carter, and then perhaps the second part is for both President and Mrs. Carter. I'm in sixth grade, and I'm interested in politics. When were you inspired to become a leader in government? That's the first part. The second part is, how do you feel about your grandson running for governor? <laughs> Well, thank the sixth grader for bringing up a subject that we were going to bring up anyway. <laughs> 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 and I'll let Rosen answer how she feels about Jason running for governor. But uh, I didn't ever dream when I was uh, young, first grade or sixth grade or high school or college, that I would go to the Naval Academy, I mean, that I would be in politics, excuse me. If you had asked me when I was five or six years old, what are you going to do when you grow up? I'd say, I want to go to Annapolis and be a naval officer. And that was my only ambition in life. And all the way through grammar school and, and, and high school and my first years of college, that was what all I wanted to do. And eventually I got an appointment to Annapolis from my local congressman uh, for a year in advance. And so I, I spent that last year at Georgia Tech, which prepared me for the Naval Academy. So I never dreamed of going into uh, politics. And I served 12 years and all in the Navy, first part in Naval ROTC, and then, and then as a midshipman and a submarine officer. I was on two battleships and then two submarines. And then we got out of the Navy, and for 17 years, I was a farmer. And during the, during, when I was 38 years old, I decided to run for the Georgia State Senate, and I was elected, and then I ran for governor. And when I ran for the Senate, I never dreamed of running for governor. When I ran for governor, I never dreamed of running for, for president until a, a year, couple of years into that office. So it was pretty late in my life when I decided to go into public service. But, but I, if you just say public service instead of politics, uh, I, th I think being in the Navy and submarines is a public service. So maybe early on in my life, I decided to go into the Navy, but uh, it was quite late in my life to decide to go into politics. And the, I'd say the best 30 something years of my life has been since I left the White House with the Carter Center. <coughs> How long can I talk about Jason? <laughs> um, well, he's he's a um, great young man. I'm so proud of him, and he has proved himself um, to be a leader. Being a Democrat in a totally Republican um, Senate, well, legislature, the whole legislature is Republican, and um, he's done some things that um, people don't understand. Um, but working, but he works across the aisle. If you're going to be on a negotiating committee, then you have to vote. You have to be able to say you'll vote for whatever comes out of it. And um, he's done that. He's um, he's made differences not, not, in not a lot a of things. Hmm? Not a campaign speech. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, that, I was asked how I feel about it. Um, but anyway. Um, he, he served in the Peace Corps in South Africa. Um, he um, graduated from Duke first, and then he came and worked at the Carter Center and got so interested in what we were doing um, that he asked Jimmy one day, um, I want to do something like you're doing. What do you suggest? And Jimmy said, I don't care what you do, but join the Peace Corps first. <laughs> and so he did, and uh, that made a great impression on him. And then he... Uh, ran for the Senate. He's in his third term in the Senate. He knows the issues because he's been there. And I just think he'll make a great governor, and I'm excited about it. And the only way we're going to win is if everybody goes out and votes. So. That was a lot briefer than I thought it was going to be. Very well, I, I, could talk, I could talk a long time about it. Uh, here's another question for both President and Mrs. Carter, and this one is from an eight-year-old girl. These are How always the most difficult. 
I, I don't know that it'll be difficult. How many people do you help every year? Well, you know, it, that's, that's hard to uh, quantify. I, I heard some of our health people say uh, at a, one of the recent uh, meetings that we will treat this year about 36 million people for different uh, diseases. And that's about the same as, as the population of California. And it's about uh, four times the population of Georgia. So that's what the Carter Center does. We actually go into the village with medicine that's given to us by Merck and, and Pfizer and some others and actually put it into the people's mouths because these uh, medicines are so precious if the people can't get them otherwise that if we give them to the government, they become contraband and, and they're just sold at a profit or they're taken away. So we have to do it directly ourselves. So uh, that doesn't include the people that we help to have uh, democracy and freedom if we help no. them have an honest and fair election. It didn't help the people that we uh, provide, I'd say, peace if we, when we negotiate between uh, two factions at war. But uh, I would say in our health program, uh, the, the answer is, is pretty accurate. And we inspire people to, uh, to have self-confidence and to have self-respect because a lot of the people that the giving hope in our slogan is, 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 is that because quite uh, often folks that are suffering from a disease for millennia or, mi or centuries uh, that can be easily er eradicated or eliminated if they do the work themselves and then they find after a year or two that they won't have the disease anymore you, you can't imagine how different they feel about themselves or even about some foreigners. And they have not only hope for the future, but respect for themselves because they've done away with the disease. We, we put as much as possible the, re the responsibility on the people that suffer to eradicate their own problem or do away with their own problem as we do outsiders. So the people that live there are the ones that do most of the work. So I can't, it's hard to quantify, but uh, millions. Uh, I'd like to make uh, two questions into one. Um, first of all, Mr. President, what impact has the Carter Center made in conflict resolution in troubled regions? And the second, uh, from an online participant, is what can I personally do as a citizen of the United States to help promote peace? Well, the number one uh, thing is for the people to want peace. And uh, when we travel around the world, the nation that's looked upon as the most warlike or militaristic on earth is the United States of America. If you look at the history since just since the war, Second World War, we have been at war almost full time with some group or the other, some nation or the other. Some of them have been major wars, obviously. Some have been just skirmishes where the United States has avoided uh, as much as possible any uh, punishment ourselves by flying high uh, airplanes that won't get shot down or by using drones. But we are looked upon as a warlike country. And uh, so I, that's a number one thing. I, I happen to be a Christian. I worship the Prince of Peace. And I think that there should be a very strict requirement before the United States goes into combat where other people are killed, uh, a just war. And uh, there are definitions of a just war about which I have written into our books sometimes or, or into our uh, op-ed pieces. So I think the first thing is for us not to want to go to war. And I think most of the military personnel do not want to go to war. They want to be prepared, like I was when I went into the submarine force, to defend my country if necessary. And uh, to be so powerful and strong that other people would avoid doing things that would violate our own security our own principles. So I'm not, I'm not bragging on myself because I had a special time, but I was challenged with a lot of uh, temptations uh, to use armed conflict when I was president. But I was able to not only keep our own country at peace, we never dropped a bomb or lost a missile or fired a bullet, but we also helped bring peace to other people. <laughs> so. <clears throat> So there, there are times for us to use our military, and I responded to a question just a while ago about attacking ISIS. I think we should do that. Uh, but I think whenever possible, uh, we should be known around the world as a champion of peace. 
and a champion of human rights, and a champion of freedom, and a champion of protecting the environment, and a champion of alleviating suffering. We should be in the forefront as a superpower in all those aspects of life. And I hope that in the future, American people will make the decisions because as you know, the political people running for office and the people in public office do basically what their folks back home want them to do. And we now have a, an attitude in America that uh, to use our military uh, is a very acceptable thing if we have a, a reasonable excuse to do so as lo and, and, and to minimize any uh, injury to ourselves. And, and I think that has been something that we ought to think about again. Mr. President, you just mentioned the environment, so I have another question here from a sixth grader who wants to know, what do you suggest our generation, hers, uh, do about our environment? Well, the subject of climate change or global warming comes up everywhere I go. Uh, as as um, Ambassador Peters would remember, I had a, a, a sessions with four different universities while we were in China the, the, during our recent 10-day visit. And the question of global warming comes up often. China is afflicted right now with terrible air pollution and water pollution. And although the United States is not as bad off as China, we are producing just about as much carbon dioxide and other, uh, other oxides into the atmosphere as China. We're just about tied. And, and I think that the best thing that we can do is to form an alliance with China, which I advocated to the Chinese leaders and I've advocated in public forums quite a bit, and also to American officials. If the United States the, the, the greatest industrialized country and China, the greatest uh, developing nation, could agree on any basic approach to the global warming issue, I think the rest of the country, countries in the world would follow along very eagerly. Europe would, India would, the rest of the world would, would do so. And I think that we ought to be now having our scientists sit down in Beijing or in Washington or halfway between in Hawaii, saying what can the two countries do that's compatible with them? because you both have problems and you both want to change to alternative sources of energy and stop uh, the massive destruction of our environment. There's no question that global warming is here. It, I think it's a major threat that faces the entire world in, in, the, in the fairly near future. Uh, there was uh, an article uh, this morning uh, in the paper about Washington, D.C. Uh, being destined to be flooded by the rising seas. And we used to live in Norfolk and the, the seawater is now coming up out of the sewers uh, on the streets in Norfolk. And, and all the outer bank, where I used to operate up and down in the ship, uh, there are people there who have fancy homes on the outer bank beaches now find that they can't get insurance on their house or can't find a ready buyer because those places are going to be wiped away by the rising oceans. Rosa and I go to Alaska every now and then. And the last time we got off a plane in Alaska, the headlines, the top headlines in the front page of the papers well, polar bears will be gone in 25 years. And Eskimo families and, uh, and Indian families who, who are the poorest people, they live on the coastal areas around uh, villages on the coast that used to be protected by ice. And now that the water is warming up and, and the ocean is rising, they are now abandoning their villages. So the, the, the definite proof of the global warming is here. And I think that we need to get along with it. As a matter of fact, we have a deadline on the in March of this next year, March 2015, where the United Nations has mandated and countries have agreed that every individual country will put forward our plan of what we're going to do about addressing the problem of global warming. And so that's going to be a, a very serious test for us. And then later on in, in, in next year will be a special session in uh, Paris uh, to uh, go over those plans to see what the world can do together. So I think it's, it's the greatest challenge we face now uh, for the human race in the future, and uh, we need to do something about it, and, uh, and each person can, 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 can do a lot, which I tried to do when I was president. So conserving energy, uh, shifting to alternative sources of energy, and reducing our consumption of fossil fuels is, is, a, is a thing that everybody knows. We're trying to put a limit on the total increase in temperature, two degrees centigrade. Uh, over the next uh, 20 years, and, and we are n now falling far behind that goal year by year. 
So I think I've talked enough about that, but uh, it's going to be a serious problem. I hope we'll all join in on it. Thank you. The next question, again, I think, for either or both, President and Mrs. Carter. Is the United States ready for a female president? Because I am, says the questioner. <laughs> well, I think that with the election. <laughs> I think we should have had one earlier. <laughs> I won't argue with my wife on that. <laughs> Rosa wants to tell you a story about Jason and Nelson Mandela. And uh, if it's... Well, it's just a fun story. And <laughs> I asked him if it would be all right to tell it. Yeah. Um, we were going to... We go to Africa pretty regularly. And we go into South Africa while Jason was in the Peace Corps. And he sent us an email and said he wanted to meet Nelson Mandela. So Jim is sent back and said, everybody wants to meet Nelson Mandela. <laughs> Why do you want to go? He said, I want to meet a politician who went to prison before he was in office. <laughs> <laughs> so we took, we, we took him with us. And Jimmy had a lot he wanted to talk to Mandela about. And so when we got there and Mandela said hello to Jason, he out, Jason answered him in Zulu, Mandela's language. And so that started a conversation. Jimmy and I sat there and listened to it, and we were totally out of the picture. Jason and Nelson Mandela took up the whole time we were supposed to be doing something. It was just a fun story. That is a fun story. That is a fun story. Um, another uh, serious Middle East question. What has happened in Egypt is heartbreaking. What can the Carter Center do to prevent the ousting of a democratically elected leader, I think perhaps elsewhere? Well, the Carter Center can't, doesn't have any authority over anybody. And when we go in to monitor an election, we have several prerequisites that we have to abide by. One is that, that the incumbent political party, the ruling party, has to invite us in. And secondly, the major opposition parties have to also want us to come in. So they both trust us to be a, a fair judge of whether the election is fair and honest. And we also have to have some standards in that country that they will abide by basic democratic principles. All the, the people in the country who, who are adults and, and qualified to vote, permitted to vote. Uh, all the qualified candidates have, have they been permitted to launch a campaign. Uh, will the votes be reasonably certain of being counted accurately? Uh, or will the government steal the election because they have the authority to control the election commission and the individual choices of ele election observers in the polling places? So those are the kind of things we have to meet. In Egypt, of course, as I said, practically none of those requirements will be met in the next election for the parliament, which is a very important election. So the, the Carter Center also at the end of every election, we generally stay there for a number of days and assess the results of the election and then we write a, a fairly definitive report that's given very high publicity, particularly in that country, because, uh, and we make it very honest about it. If, if the country does some good things and some bad things, we report that. And, and, we, and we see warning signs about the future, we report those. We will be, we are drafting a, a statement this week, as a matter of fact, about wh why we are withdrawing from participating in the, in the Egyptian election, and that will have some impact in Egypt and also in Europe and other places that send in election observers. So the Carter Center is looked upon, I would say, as a number one authentic gov uh, election observer organization that there is. So when we say something is wrong in a country, it, it sometimes has a, a beneficial effect because they change their policies so we won't criticize them in the future and others won't. But uh, as far as preventing the overthrow of an elected president or elected official, uh, I don't think we have that authority. We don't claim to have that authority. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, switching gears, we have a question from a baseball fan, and I'll read it. When will Mrs. Carter go to a Braves game? I heard she is their lucky charm, and they always win when she attends. Please go to a game and help them out. <laughs> <laughs> go ahead. 
I love baseball and I love the Braves and I've been really distressed lately. But, um, <laughs> I'd be willing to go any time. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And, and most of the time when I go, they do win. Yeah. If what he said was true, Rosa could get the same income that some of the baseball players could. <laughs> so we would excuse her from the Carter Center and just let her go to baseball games <laughs> full time and let the income come, you know, not to her but to the Carter Center. <laughs> um, and the next question also from the audience is, do you have any thoughts on decriminalization of drugs that you would like to share? The thoughts, not the drugs. <laughs> <clears throat> yes, I have thoughts. In, in fact, 30 something years ago in 1979, I made a major speech on drug policy. And I advocated not punishment for owners of, uh, of drugs, but rehabilitation for those who had drugs in their possession, particularly marijuana, and who used them and didn't sell them. And I call for the decriminalization of marijuana. Not legalization, but when somebody is, is found just possessing marijuana, they could be arrested, they could be brought to trial, but they wouldn't be put in prison. And, uh, and that person would, would then have been required, if my policy had stayed in effect, to, be, to go to treatment to make sure that they could get away from any addiction that they had to marijuana or to other, uh, or to other drugs. And, and that would still be my, my preference. As you know, as you may know, my successor in the White House uh, abandoned that policy and he began uh, to say, we'll do away with drugs. And, and so we began to send massive amounts of money and military equipment and so forth uh, to countries where the drugs were produced and, uh, and that's been a war against drugs at the source. And it hasn't worked. In fact, it's just continued to increase. So I think the demand for drugs is, is an important element of it. So I would say decriminalization, not, uh, not uh, legalization. And, and one of the results of this uh, putting prison, people in prison who are just caught with marijuana has been that the number of pr people in prison now is six times as great as it was when I left the White House. And now America has the highest prison population on earth. We have a higher percentage of Americans in prison than any country in the world. And, uh, and we don't know what to do about it now because, uh, because it ex it's just as expensive to keep somebody in the Georgia State Prison as it is to, to pay their full fees uh, to go to a, a good university. And uh, so I would say that we need to cut down on the prison population and, and make some changes about uh, not putting people in prison who just have a possession of drugs, provided they have no uh, accusation against them, they are trying to disperse drugs. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, Mr. President, you were criticized for speaking to ISNA, the Islamic Society of North America. What did you tell them? <laughs> well, this, this is the largest uh, Muslim uh, organization in America. Uh, it has... Uh, hundreds of thousands of, of uh, members, and they meet once a year. And they asked me to come and speak to them about my latest book, and that is about the abuse of women and girls. Because we're working very closely with the Islamic or Muslim leaders in other countries. In fact, one of my main allies in this entire process to get rid of abuse of women and girls is the Grand Imam of, uh, of Al-Azhar in Egypt. He's not only the president of a university that has 120,000 students, but he's also the Muslim the theologian, theologian leader, theological leader in the world. So when he speaks on a subject about what the Koran says, people listen to him. And his premise is the same of, as mine, that uh, holy scriptures don't preach that girls are inferior to boys. They, they preach that all people are equal in the eyes of God. He agrees with this. So, so the Muslim group in America asked me to come and speak to them about my book, which I did. Uh, they, there were about uh, 12,000 people in the audience that heard me speak, and they, and they had imams come from I this country and from other countries, and they signed a, a, a pledge that they would cooperate with the Carter Center on eliminating or reducing the abuse of women and girls. By the way, while I, I spoke to a smaller group at lunch who were rich people that, that helped finance the program, and uh, b before my speech, uh, President Obama spoke to them, and President Bush and Obama have spoken to the entire group 
uh, in the past. And, and the members of this Muslim group are welcome frequently uh, at the White House whenever the White House wants to have a group that has multiple religions and not just have a Christian meeting. Uh, these are the folks that they invite to come and represent the Muslim community. They are very moderate in their position. They are against violence. And so I had no compunction about going to visit them. But some of the people claimed that they were uh, against Israel, that they were terrorists and, and that sort of thing. So I, I do, I take action every now and then that's not completely acceptable to everybody on earth. Looking back over your amazing life, what would you consider your greatest accomplishment and what lies ahead for you? Well, I mentioned earlier about China. I think the, the, the decision I made after 30 years of, of uh, animosity with China to have normal relations with them was, would have the most uh, beneficial effect in the world. Uh, one of the most gratifying things that I did, obviously, was to bring peace between Egypt and Israel. They had been at war four times in the previous 25 years, and they hated each other for good reason. The most difficult political challenge that I've ever faced in my life was having a new treaty with uh, Panama about the canal. And to get 67 senators to vote for that treaty was uh, excruciatingly painful for me and, and for many of the people who voted for it, but I think it was the right thing to do. So all of those things are, are, are good, good memories in my mind. I might point out that there were 20 senators who voted for the canal treaties in 1978 who were up for re-election that year. Of the 20 senators, only seven of them came back to the Senate the following year. And the attrition rate in 1980 was almost as great. But I would say the thing that's brought me the most personal gratification in politics has been the human rights policy that we inaugurated and put into effect. That every statement and every policy of America in foreign policy and, and domestically would be guided by the principles of human rights based on the, the 30 paragraphs in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. I think that has had some very beneficial effects around the world. In fact, one, one just quick example was, would be in, in Latin America where when I came into office, almost every country in South America was a military dictatorship. And we imposed our human rights policy very strongly on them, sometimes almost with force, by denying them IMF loans and that sort of thing if they didn't uh, correct their human rights abuses. And within seven years, every country in South America was a democracy. So that's the kind of thing that can be done by just insisting on basic, a basic principle like honoring people's right uh, to peace and justice and uh, and freedom. Here's a very specific question. What are the lessons learned from your West Africa agricultural initiatives, sorghum and maize with Sasakawa? Well, we, the Carter Center decided in 1986, just a few years after we were formed, to, to, uh, to look into this problem, a question. We had a, a Japanese man named Ryoichi Sasakawa who was extremely wealthy. And Dr. Norman Bullock was the hero of the agricultural community in that he won the Nobel Peace Prize for the so-called Green Revolution. And they wanted the Carter Center to head up this move into Africa to teach the people how to grow more food grain. And so no, Sasakawa and, and Bullock and I met twice in Geneva, Switzerland to work out the details of our program. And we finally decided to teach small farmers in Africa how to grow more food grain. And we concentrated on just things to eat, uh, corn, maize, which they call maize, uh, millet, sorghum, wheat, rice, and so forth. We didn't deal with cotton or tobacco or, cro or, or cash crops like that. So we began to do this, and eventually we had the program in 15 African countries. We taught 8 million people how to work their crops better so they could double or triple their total production. And we also introduced to them some very beneficial uh, genetically modified seed, corn for instance, because if, you, if, they, if you're a farmer, you know if you feed corn to chickens or to hogs, they will starve to death. You have to add supplement because there are 12 amino acids that a human being or any animal has to have, and corn only has 10 of them. So you've got to add something to the corn 
so they can survive. But there was a, a development in uh, Mexico of a, of, a, of a corn seed that had all 12 amino acids. So we introduced that, and now it's used in millions of acres of land all over Africa and Asia, even into China. Uh, even North Korea now has tried it out. So those are the kind of things that the Carter Center was able to do. Uh, and, what? and you can give it to babies as a full. Yeah, you can give it to babies as a full formula. You can you can give it, your baby grits, uh, if you, if it's if it's genetically corn, and and they can survive and and flourish. But if you feed your child just corn mush by itself, they'll starve to death. Any animal will. So that's the kind of thing that we were able to do with uh, with eight million farm families. And so it was a very gratifying thing to us. And over a period of years, Dr. John Hardman was stayed on the board uh, until this, this year, as a matter of fact. But we withdrew later, and now uh, the Sasakawa Foundation, which is still Japanese-owned, Mr. Mr. Sasakawa died, founded it, has now reached out to the Gates Foundation and others to help with this program. So they've taken it over. But it was a very gratifying experience for us. It was called Global 2000. And, and later it was called Sasakawa Global 2000 because the Sasakawa family provided all the money. But it was, it was very exciting for me as a farmer uh, and also to Dr. Bullock, who was very gratified by it. The last question we have time for is a fitting follow-up, and that is, what is the Carter Center's greatest accomplishment, Mr. President? Well, it, that's hard to say. I, I, I think that uh, we've been able to promote peace and, and democracy and freedom with our monitoring elections. We've set standards for other observers of elections to follow that, that would make them uh, high quality and also understood by the people being monitored in a troubled election nation or, or, or so forth. But I would say that the most good that the Carter Center has done has been in the field of health care. Uh, eradicating guinea worm will be the second disease in history ever eradicated from the face of the earth, and that will come in the next few years. We only have, as, as I said, 80, 60 uh, cases in the whole world right now. We know every one of those cases, and we hope we can get rid of them soon. And, and we, we have we prevented 88 million people, the World Health Organization estimates, from having guinea worm just by pre preventing it from coming back into Ill diseases. So I would say the greatest achievement of the Carter Center has been to bring hope for people and self-respect for people when they see that a disease that has afflicted them and their ancestors will never be there again. And that's, that's been perhaps the most gratifying thing for me and Rosen to see as well, the change in the life of people uh, when they have a prospect for a better future. Please join me in thanking President and Mrs. Carter for their amazing insights and stories.